This video is going to demonstrate doing multivariate analysis of images using MIA Toolbox or Solo Plus MIA. Uh, the main focus of this video is actually to show you the difference between doing normal multivariate analysis and image multivariate analysis. If you want to learn more about the fundamentals of multivariate analysis, I encourage you to look at, for instance, the Eigen Guide videos on PCA, PLS, or PLSDA, and other ones that are on the website, or look at the Chemometrics tutorial, which is available from the Help menu. So getting started, let's just open analysis in PCA mode, and I'll just choose PCA from my favorites here or from the Decomposition tab. When analysis opens up, of course, there's no data loaded. And I'm going to load my image data here, which I happen to have as an NV file, and just drag that to analysis, and it loads it into X for me. And here you can see it's a 145 by 145 pixel image with 220 variables. As typical, you know, I've reviewed this data and looked at it to understand what's there and understand the methods. That's not as critical to what I'm showing now, but I am going to choose the preprocessing, which is always the, the uh, next step after you've reviewed your data. In this case, I want to do a multiplicative scatter correction. Whoops. If I grab the right one. To the mean, and then a mean centering after that. With that set, we can go ahead and calculate our model. And this is where we will hit the first difference between normal data and image data. It recognized that the image data is quite large and that cross-validation, which was turned on by default, could take a lot of time. So it offers me the choice to go ahead and cross-validate, knowing it may take a while, or skip it for this particular data, or just turn it off until I start up again. I'm going to go ahead and turn it off, and our model is calculated, the PCA model is calculated. It is defaulted to three components, thinking that that's a sufficient number. Normally, I would go ahead and review how many I want uh, in the usual way in, of a PCA model. But what I really want to show you is what is different in terms of images, because that part is all very similar. If I click on the Scores button here, you'll start to see the differences right off the bat. The options are very similar to a normal uh, PCA model. But the way that the results are displayed is very different. First of all, if you look at an individual score, say for instance, I'm going to double click on this images of scores on PC1. You can see that instead of seeing individual points versus an x-axis, we're viewing an image. And if I add a color bar, which is in the top toolbar up here, to this image, you can see that the scale is the blue down at very negative numbers, and yellow here up at the very positive numbers. And we get some difference, on some sense of the differences around the image on that PC. If I look at scores on PC2, you can see that PC2 is capturing some very small features throughout the image, and PC3 is capturing different features. We can also look at the Q residuals and the Hotelling's T squared in the same way. You can see as soon as I go to the Q residuals, there are some exceptionally large Q residuals that in fact are swamping out the entire image. I only see a couple bright spots. One useful feature here, as talked about earlier in another video, is the auto Y scale, which in this case does an auto contrast. Once I click on that, we can see very clearly the regions of the image that are not well captured or well described by this model. And similarly for the Hotelling's T squared, here are the regions of the image that project very strongly into the image. Another big difference, though, is how the Q and T squared plots, or in fact any uh, plot of one item versus another look. Normally, on a Q versus T squared plot, you have one point for each sample in the data. Well, in an image data, each sample is each pixel, and so we have a tremendous number of pixels in this data. In fact, if you click on the button that is labeled Toggle Image Plots On Off, which has an image with a line through it, it'll switch back to the normal mode. And you can see there's a couple of very unusual points. Here is that pixel that was very hot in the other image we looked at with very high Q residuals, and a couple that have very high T squared. But most of them are down here in this lower range. I'm going to roll my mouse wheel to zoom in on this lower range. 
And you can see there's a tremendous number of points down there, so much so that we can't even tell what's there. If I go back to the image view of this data, now when I zoom in, you can see that in fact we're viewing the number of points as the color. So there's in this yellow region a lot of points. There's far fewer points out here in the bluer regions. So instead of showing where the points are, we're actually seeing the density. We see the same sort of thing with a score score plot. If I double click the score score plot, we get PC scores on PC2 versus scores on PC1. And again, the color shows us how dense the points are. There's a higher density here and a higher density here. One feature I'll mention right now that is particularly helpful with these plots is actually buried in the settings. If you go to, and let me move this so you'll be able to see, if you go to the Edit All Settings toolbar button, which is off the side of my setup, this brings you to the settings for all of the plot controls items. And there are many, many options in here, ways to change lots of view. But if you go down to the image section, image settings, this density bins maximum is a particularly useful one. I'm going to change that to be a lower number to make it easier for you to see in this video. So now you can see the density bins. There's far fewer here. You can see very high density here, high density there, a lower density in these regions, and high density there. What does that mean? Well, those are probably pixels that are related. I'll bring up a second plot, the image on scores on PC1. Double click that so I've got those. And again, arranging this so you'll be able to see them both on the smaller video screen here. Now, just like in regular scores plots, we have linking between these. So if I select points in my score score plot, we'll see where they show up in the other. I'm actually going to switch to the lasso mode, and then I'm going to select this lobe of points over here. When I do that, it also selects them on my image. And I can see that this area, which I think in fact is sort of a marshland, shows up and it's related, it's similar to this region. Well, conversely, we can take on this image, I want to know where did those pixels show up? So I select them here and back on my image, when I score, score plot, they show up there. This linking between the two allows us to investigate the chemical differences as shown in the scores and the physical location of those differences. So we can see that all of these now selected pixels are all related to each other spectroscopically by the underlying science. There's also a sort of another separate area here I can see which is of interest. And when I select that we can see that that's these other boundaries. And the one thing I didn't see selected in any of these was this region up here. And when I select that, and we get that highlighted in our density plot here, once I update for the, uh, you can see that that actually shows up right near the middle of the data. So, ah, right down there. Now, the other thing that can be very different in these is uh, sometimes with a very low density it's sometimes hard to find the points but always selecting you can tell that there's something up there and just as usual we can exclude on the same plot and once we do those exclusions back as usual back in our original model we have the data closed uh, the data the model has disappeared and we can rebuild it That is one of the primary differences between doing image analysis and standard analysis. Otherwise, the interpretation of the results is all very similar. One final thing I want to mention to you is if you do make selections on an image, for instance, let's find the image plot here. 
If I make a selection of some pixels, let's say these, I can then right click those and say I want to set the class of those pixels. So we'll call this field. It will automatically switch me over into class mode and you can see that they've been marked as red. I'm then going to select the region over here, right click that, and say set class other field. And then finally, with that set, I'm also going to go and do one more, which is the marshland. Set class marshland. With those set, those changes got pushed all the way back to my original data. And so now, for instance, we could go and do a PLSDA model, and the classes will be my three classes. Build a model from that. I'm going to choose three components. And here again, just like with the PCA model, everything is displayed in image format rather than in individual sample format. It came up with the classes enabled. I'm going to actually disable, turn off classes. This toolbar button here will do that for us. And now in my individual images, if I double click on one of these to show you, here is the regions that were marked as being field. Clearly there's something unique in that spot. Here is the other field. These are the regions that matched what the other field looked like. And finally, marshland. Now the one other thing that we ought to look in here, of course, at is the Q residuals. And if you remember from that first image, the one that had this region selected, there's actually high Q residuals there. You can also select more than one item to show in this same view. For example, if we come up to the class predicted probability, I can view probability of field, probability of other field, probability of marshland, and if I select all three of those, I will get an RGB map. And if I put a legend onto this, I can see the probability of field is in red, probability of other field is green, and blue is the probability of marshland. If you look carefully, you'll notice that some of these have zero probability, indicating that there's something else going on with those individual classes. That's a basic introduction of manipulating images and working with them in multivariate analysis. There are clearly many other things you can do. We haven't talked much about the drill tool, which allows you to dig through, or for instance, the cross-section tool, which I will show quickly as I talk here, which allows me to drag a cross-section and see how the image changes as a function of spatial distance here. So there's many tools along those lines, but hopefully this gives you an introduction to understanding how to work with images in the most basic way.